Hello friends, this is Santanam from Smart Leaders IAS. In this video, we will be looking at the editorials which came on the 23rd of February. The first article that we are going to look at is titled, Is the Supreme Court Verdict on Kaveri Fair? Which came on the 23rd of February. So what is this article about? This article is about the recent verdict on Kaveri River Water Allocation to Karnataka and Tamil Nadu by the Supreme Court. Before we jump into the article, we will try to understand the history of Kaveri River Water Dispute first. See, in 1892, there was an agreement between the Madras Presidency and the Mysore state, based on which the amount of water which has to be utilized by the Mysore state and the amount of water which has to be let into the Madras Presidency was decided. In 1924, there was a very important agreement which the Mysore state had with Madras Presidency with regards to the amount of water which, ha which it can use and which it has to let into the Madras Presidency. And remember that the earlier Mysore state is the region which is currently occupied by uh, Karnataka and parts of Kerala and the Madras presidency which is majorly occupied currently by Tamil Nadu state. And this 1924 agreement with the Madras presidency, Mysore state was allowed to construct Krishna Raja Sagara Dam and use that water for the irrigation purposes in the southern Karnataka region in the southern regions of the Mysore state and it was mentioned in the agreement that this, this water division formula or this water allocation formula is valid for 50 years which is until 1974. But India attained independence in 1947 and from 1947 till the 1970s Karnataka government did not violate this agreement of 1924 which was actually in, which was actually inducted in the 1924 in the pre-independent era they still did not violate it they continued to follow it but towards the end towards 1970s the necessity for drinking water and the necessity for uh, water for irrigation in, increased a lot in Karnataka and because of which there were frequent clashes amongst the people of both the states with regards to sharing of Kaveri water and it has to be noted that a central government study in the 1970s clearly showed that even before the expiry of the agreement, both Karnataka and Tamil Nadu expanded its agriculture, which is violative of the 1924 agreement. The 1924 agreement clearly stated that you can only have so much amount of agricultural land in your respective state. And this was applicable for Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. By 1974, both states have expanded their agriculture, leading to an increased consumption of water from the river Kaveri, which was unsustainable. In 1972, the central government set up the Kaveri Fact-Finding Committee. And the final reports of the Fact-Finding Committee clearly says that Kaveri water, water utilization in Tamil Nadu was 489 TMC against Karnataka's 177 TMC. But Karnataka demands 465 TMC against its present usage against its then usage of 312 TMC and it is in this scenario that Tamil Nadu goes to the Supreme Court. In 1990 the Supreme Court ordered the constitution of Kaveri Water Tribunal and this tribunal in 1991 gave an interim award about the allocation of Kaveri water between the states. From 1991 Till 2007, it was a period of quiet and turbulence because whenever there was surplus monsoon, both the states did not have anything to fight for because there was enough water. But when there was a deficit in the monsoon, both states accused each other of exploiting Kaveri water for themselves. And in 2007, the tribunal awarded the water allocation in the following formula, where Tamil Nadu gets 419 TMCs. Karnataka gets 270 TMCs. But the recent verdict in 2018, the Supreme Court has held that Tamil Nadu shall have 404 TMCs and Karnataka shall have 284 TMCs. Notice that this has been the change in Tamil Nadu's share and this has been the change in Karnataka's share where it, there is a slight decrease of 2% in Tamil Nadu's share and a slight increase of 2% in Karnataka share. Kerala and Pondicherry are also beneficiaries of Kaveri water and their share of Kaveri water has not changed between the 2007 verdict and the 2018 verdict. So what are the 
concerns addressed in the 2018 verdict. First of all, the Supreme Court makes it clear that the contentious 1924 agreement has lapsed and it notes that this agreement was signed during a time when Karnataka did not have any bargaining power because remember it was signed between the Mysore state held by the Vodayar kings and Madras presidency held by the British Raj. So that was not on equitable terms and they did not have any bargaining power while signing that agreement. So that agreement is no longer valid. Also the Supreme Court acknowledges that there is a need for a higher share of drinking water for the city of Bengaluru. The 2007 verdict which we saw earlier did not take into consideration Bengaluru's need of drinking water while calculating the amount of water that has to be allocated for the state of Karnataka. But the 2018 verdict clearly addresses this issue and makes it a point that Bengaluru's drinking water should also be brought into the formula for calculating Kaveri river water allocation for Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Also, the verdict clearly says that a minimum of 10 TMC of groundwater is available in the Kaveri delta of Tamil Nadu and it can use that. And this fact has been ignored in the previous tribunal order of 2007. But there are still certain pending issues with regards to the Kaveri allocation of Kaveri water. The first being the Interstate Water Disputes Act stipulates that there needs to be a technical expert, two technical experts to be exact, present in the tribunal and this is still absent. There has to be two technical experts to actually scientifically analyze and give data to the tribunal. Also, till date there is no framing of a deficit formula because without this it will be very difficult to allocate water in terms of monsoon deficit years and it cannot be, it is not possible for constructing hydro projects or water reservoirs. Finally, the issues of climate change and the allocation of regenerated and surplus water have not been considered, which means whenever there is a drought or whenever there is a flood, we still don't know what to do with the deficient or excess water supply. So these are the pending issues which needs to be addressed very soon. Moving on to the next article, which is titled an umbrella for the consumer, which came on the 23rd of February. This article explains the salient features of the recently tabled Consumer Protection Bill 2018. So what are its salient features? Firstly, it brings about the concept of product liability action, which means the manufacturer is now responsible if there is a problem with the product leading to an injury or death of the consumer. And as it says, property damages for the consumer is also now a liability for the manufacturer of the product. The pecuniary jurisdiction has been revised. What is pecuniary jurisdiction? To understand that, let's go for an example. A consumer is filing a case against a manufacturer for violating his rights as a consumer. And he says that he, is, he needs a compensation for 10 lakh rupees. And there is another consumer who is filing a case against a manufacturer and he says he wants a compensation or his damages are worth say 1000 crore rupees. Let's call this consumer as C1 and this as and him as C2. See consumer 1 and consumer 2 will not be going to the same court for getting their grievances redressed because the consumer 2's grievance is definitely higher and bigger than consumer 1 which means there is a need for allocation of cases based on the worth of damages or fines which has been met by the consumer. So pecuniary jurisdiction here means the limit of the amount of damage incur incurred by the consumer has been increased for specific courts which means the courts which used to try cases worth only 10 lakh rupees can now try up to 10 crore rupees. So this revision means the number of allocated cases for a particular court has been expanded and more consumers can get their redressal quickly. Another salient feature of this bill is that false or misleading advertisements shall now be punished with imprisonment and a fine and also with a fine. Also celebrities can be prosecuted for endorsing products with misleading claims. The bill also proposes 
mediation as an alternative dispute resolution mechanism which means that instead of facing instead of fighting in the court they can mediate and arrange for a settlement the new bill allows complaints to be filed electronically and it introduces the idea of class action suits so what is a class action suit a class action suit is one where a member of a community can file a case against a manufacturer representing the entire community by himself or herself so that is a class action suit and another key feature of this uh, bill is that it tries to define the concept of e-commerce because most of the transactions are happening in the e-commerce business right now the amount of e-commerce trade which has been happening has increased drastically and it needs to be regulated so they are trying to define the term e-commerce finally and most importantly the bill proposes central consumer protection authority which has the ability to promote protect and enforce the rights of consumers this ccpa or central consumer protection authority is headed by a chief commissioner and it is empowered to investigate recall refund and impose penalties it also deals with unfair trade practices and misleading advertisements so this is very important with regards to this consumer protection bill to conclude this bill promises a fresh and positive new change for consumers and it is a right step towards consumer protection and consumer rights awareness.